Um, thank you all for joining us today for this webinar on our Viva Florida Landscape Demonstration Garden Grant Program, mouthful. Um, my name is Stacey Matrazo. I'm the program manager for the Florida Wildfire Foundation, and I manage um, this grant program. Over the next hour, we will go through the entire application process, um, and I'll hopefully answer, well, I will answer as many questions as I can, but hopefully um, you'll get a lot of those questions answered during the presentation. My goal is to help you determine whether or not your project qualifies for funding through our program and explain what you need to do in order to successfully complete that application. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, all attendees are muted and your cameras are off. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so it'll be available for viewing and sharing on our website and our YouTube channel in uh, approximately 24 hours, give or take. Um, you can submit questions through the Q&A feature at any point during the presentation, uh, though I will say, you know, try to hold off because I'm going to go into a lot of detail, so you'll probably get a lot of your questions answered um, through the presentation. But um, feel free to post them in the Q&A section. We do have the chat feature, but I will not be checking that for questions, so please, please, please use the Q&A feature um, to answer your question or to ask your question. If uh, something's not answered today, or if during any point in the application period you have questions, you can always email me at smatrazo at flawildflowers.org. Um, in case you're not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitat through education, planting, conservation, and research programs. We do this primarily through funds raised from the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. Whether you have the old design or the new design, um, both of those provide donations to this organization. And since 2000, we've received more than $4 million in license plate funds. And these funds, along with donations and memberships, allow us to provide grants like the Viva Florida one that you're going to hear about today as well as grants for school gardens, um, allows us to conduct research topics or research projects on topics that are relevant to both the commercial and the residential interest, and to produce a ton of different helpful handouts and brochures on plant selection, growing, maintaining, attracting wildlife, and so much more. We'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to uh, consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. So with that out of the way, uh, let's get right into this program. The Viva Florida Landscape Demonstration Garden is meant to illustrate the benefits and beauty of Florida's native wildflowers and plants in a cultivated landscape. We're trying to encourage people to use natives in their landscapes and we feel that seeing them in a cultivated setting can help people envision how those plants might perform in their own landscapes. Um, restoration projects are also permitted in the Viva Florida program, but they still must meet all of the requirements, um, including education and access, which we'll get to shortly. Um, Viva Florida funded gardens should aim to increase awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers among visitors um, which includes educating the general public about the role of native plants um, in supporting native pollinators, providing habitat, providing ecological services like uh, dealing with air and water pollution, adding nutrients to the soil, preventing erosion, and so on. Sorry about that. Um, so grant requirements. This is a quick overview of what is required from all awardees. We'll go over each of these in detail a bit later, but briefly, applicants must agree to establish, expand, or um, enhance a native planting in a highly visible location with frequent pedestrian traffic. Again, we're trying to show people these gardens and how to do this in their home landscape. So we want areas that are gonna attract visitors. Um, you also have to agree to maintain this planting for a minimum of one year from installation. Uh, of course, we encourage you to plan for the long term, but for the purpose of the grant, you have to maintain it for one year. You have to provide 50% match, 
toward the amount that you are requesting. And this can be monetary um, or in-kind donations. Uh, it just has to be 50% or more of what you're requesting. So if you request $3,000, which is the maximum that this grant will provide, you must show at least a $1,500 in-kind match. And again, in-kind contributions can be donations of materials or services. It can be volunteer time. You can even apply staff time related to the project toward that 50% match. Grantees also must agree to use at least 80% of the funds to purchase Florida native plants and seeds. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more too. But again, if you're requesting the $3,000 maximum, you must commit $2,400 of that to plant and seed material. The remaining 20% can be spent on other project needs like tools, educational materials, irrigation, um, you know, whatever else you might need, you can spend that money on. You must agree to develop educational materials and programs. And again, I'll, I'll be getting into all these in detail, but education is really important to this program and to the foundation. Um, it's great to have these gardens visible, but if people can't learn about them while they're there, uh, they're not meeting our needs. So you do have to uh, develop a good, strong educational components. You're required to submit four scheduled reports and um, provide access to a representative from the foundation at any time with advance notice, of course, um, so that we can evaluate the project's establishment, uh, maintenance, and, and so on. So uh, who is eligible? Any nonprofit organization or public agency uh, who manages a publicly accessible land may apply. So this can include, um, but is not limited to city, county, state parks, botanical gardens, nature or environmental education centers, county extension lands, municipal properties such as city administration buildings, and even privately owned uh, publicly accessible properties are um, eligible. For example, a nonprofit may own land on which they want to install a demonstration garden or they may lease it from a private landowner. This is all fine, again, as long as the other requirements are met. So if the land is publicly accessible and can um, you know, elicit the traffic we're looking for, then it is eligible for funding. Projects that have received funding through the Viva Florida program within the last year are not eligible for additional funding unless they get it pre-approved first. So if you received funding from us in the last year, if you're currently uh, working on a, um, a grant program or a grant project, you need to contact me before you apply. And, uh, and we can talk about, you know, what your what your goals are with regard to that. The grant is distributed in two payments. So you will get 50% of the award up front once we receive your signed contract and invoice. And uh, I'm going to get into the important dates in just a moment. But once we get your contract and invoice, everything's squared away, we will issue a check for the for initial 50%. The balance of the grant is not distributed until the end of the grant cycle when your final report is received and approved. This also includes uh, receipts for all of the things that you've, you've purchased for the, the program. So you should be prepared to pay for some of the costs up front with an understanding that you'll be reimbursed for the remaining 50% at the end of the grant cycle. So this is our timeline for um, you know, major points throughout the process. We begin accepting applications January 1st and we will accept them through March 15th. I do recommend that you get them in early, which will allow time for a preliminary review. So I can go through and find anything that might need clarification or perhaps request minor changes to you know, get your application in line with our requirements. If we have advanced time, I can give you more attention and help work with you on your application. Um, if it comes in on the 15th, that's totally fine. Um, but we will, we, if we have questions, we will be expecting an immediate response because we will need to get these into our planning committee for uh, the, the big review of all the applications. So between March 16th and May 14th, we review them 
Um, I will be going over the rubric that we use at the end of this presentation, so you'll kind of understand what we're looking for and how we score your applications. Um, if there are questions during this time, again, I'll be reaching out to the applicant um, and requesting a fairly quick response because you know once the once I've vetted your application and they're passed on, then they they are under committee review. So it's really um, easier if we can get some of these things worked out. And generally, the applications are they don't require a lot of um, changes, if you will. But any application that doesn't have all the necessary information, and if I can't get a response from you in a timely manner to get that information, then the application gets kicked aside. So again, I'll go over that rubric um, as we get into this a little bit later. On May 15th, we will send out notifications to all applicants to let them know whether the application has been, um, if we're gonna award the request or if we are going to um, decline it at this time. If your project is denied funding, I'm happy to provide feedback upon request. Um, and of course, you are always able to resubmit if, you, if your project is still on, ongoing when the next grant cycle opens, you're welcome to resubmit um, as many times as you need to. Um, between May 16th and May 31st, I will issue contracts to the awardees. You will have, uh, you know, as soon as you can get those signed and returned to me along with an invoice for 50% of whatever the award amount is, um, then we will get that check cut to you. So usually between, uh, you know, June 1st and June 30th. Your project should be timed appropriately with regard to the application approval and payment dates. So we will not consider projects that are already underway or expected to begin before the applications have been reviewed. Generally speaking, planning should take place in the fall and a May 15th award notification allows sufficient time for site prep prior to a fall planting. If you are planning for a spring planting, if your planting is planned you know, before the application review period ends, you'll want to apply a year in advance. So if you're looking at planting in March of 2020, it's too late. You, you won't, you, your application will not be accepted this time. If you're planning for a spring planting in 2022, then you should apply during this uh, window beginning January 1. So let's go through all the application requirements. Um, first and foremost, project manager contact information. This is the person who accepts responsibility for overseeing the project, submitting reports, and making sure the terms of the contract are met. This is also the person that I will be reaching out to um, for any inquiries I have, status updates, etc., during the grant period or during the application review period as well. <clears throat> And if your application is approved for funding, this project manager is gonna be the person that um, you know, I, I talk to to get everything in line and get the contract going. When we ask for the project location, we're looking for a physical address of where the demonstration will be planted. Um, we're also looking for information on uh, the property owner. So if you are not the property owner, if you are leasing this property, you will be required to submit the landowner's contact information, uh, information on your lease expiration date, and a letter of support from the property owner that says that this project is permitted. We're also looking for um, annual number of visitors to the facility or to the area that is being planted, um, either real or anticipated. And if it's anticipated numbers you're providing, you just need to give support for your estimate. You know, How did you come up with those numbers? <clears throat> Excuse me. As far as planting project details goes, we um, have quite a few different things we're looking, we're asking about. One is the specific location. So I know we have the physical address um, you've given us, but now we want to know where in this area is it going to be planted? Is it at the entrance of a park? Is it a trailhead or accessible from a trail? Is it next to a visitor center or in front of the city administration building, etc.? If you can give GPS coordinates, um, that is ideal. You're also, um, you also might want to send an aerial map, like a Google map that shows the planting site marked. This is not required, but it can be helpful for us in kind of envisioning where this is going to be. 
We also want to know the dimensions. You know, how big is this planting? Um, what, what shape and what size is it? What are the soil moisture and light exposure conditions? Is it a sandy, dry soil in full sun, or is this a saturated site in uh, you know partial shade or etc. And we want to know about the current and past conditions of the area that's going to be planted. So we're asked you to include a list of native, non-native, and invasive species that are or have recently been growing in and around the site. If you are unsure if a plant is invasive, check the Atlas of Florida Plants or the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council websites. Um, you can find a lot of pictures and information on both of these, but if you aren't able to determine what the species is, you can also email the, a photo to me. And if I don't know what it is, I have lots of people at my disposal that can help us determine what plants we're dealing with. If invasives have been or are being removed from the, the area, we want to know what the method is, how long ago if they were removed, um, you know, did you use herbicide or mechanical removal, hand removal, um, or how did you manage those invasives? We also want a preliminary plants that you're gonna use in the planting. You'll need to have an estimate from a nursery when you get to the budget section of the application. So you'll, need, you'll already have to have this determined before you apply. This is preliminary. We understand all of the plants that you, you spec for your project may not be available when you're ready to plant or you know, something else might come up and you need to swap something out. That's fine, it's acceptable. This is just to give us an idea of what you are planning or hoping for. And when the time comes to actually get to the planting, if you need to change out plants, uh, we just ask that you know, notify us. Species that you include in your list must be appropriate for your region and site conditions. So what hardiness zone are you located in? What are the conditions that you've just recently told us about? The sun and the moisture conditions. Choosing plants that are naturally suited for your site conditions and for your region will help ensure success. And that's what we're hoping for. Um, your plants also need to be purchased from uh, members of the Florida Association of Native Nurseries or other retail outlets that specialize in Florida native plants. This will ensure that you're getting true native species or native cultivars. It will ensure that you're getting plants that aren't um, treated with systemic pesticides or other chemicals. If you are seeding, if you're using seed, uh, we recommend the Florida Wildflower Growers Cooperative. And these websites that I'm sharing with you are in the application. So when you, if you don't have, you know, if you're not jotting these down or if you've forgotten, it's all in the application as a little handy resource for everyone who's fine. For the description of the planting, um, this is where you get really detailed on how you're gonna do this. So what is your timeline? When do you plan to do your site prep, do your planting, um, et cetera? Site preparation methods are important. Site prep can make or break a planting, especially if the site has a lot of weed pressure or if invasives are or were present. We have included some um, site prep resources in the application. We have um, a write-up on solarization. I've also got the Xerxes site prep guide here, which gives um, instructions on several different types of site prep, chemical and non-chemical methods. Depending on the conditions, we generally recommend solarization. And this is literally covering the, covering the area to be planted in plastic. Um, solarization is most effective if it's done between June and mid-August when the sun is highest in the sky and the days are longest. If it's done too late or not done long enough, it will not work as well. It is um, our method of choice, but it's not always the best method. It's really, um, you know, you'll need to determine that. <clears throat> Some other methods, um, the turn plow method where you literally upend the soil, flip it over, um, it's a non-chemical method and it is most effective in sites that are primarily sod. Um, we also have sheet mulching. We have a few um, grantees who've used sheet mulching, which is again another non-chemical way where you cover the ground with cardboard and then uh, cover that in mulch and then the cardboard will break down in the soil. 
Chemical methods should be used as a last resort. Um, they should not, you should not use um, residual extended or pre-emergent weed control chemicals though. And if you have questions about that, um, you know, I can have a conversation with you separate um, that will kind of talk about your seed prep, or excuse me, your site prep methods. Um, but again, you should be able to determine this, what's going to work best for you, given the size, given the conditions, and given uh, the, the manpower that you have or people power. So getting back to that project description, um, we're also looking for construction methods. So this is going to refer to any additional elements like paths or borders, other integral features, drainage, irrigation, anything else besides the actual plants themselves, if this is applicable. Um, we need maintenance methods and schedule. So who is going to be managing the maintenance? Is it going to be your staff, volunteers? Are you hiring a contractor? And what frequency and method will you be using? Um, I should note here that if you are using mulch, in the planting, like for weed control, we recommend pine straw, um, especially if you have plantings that are strong in, in herbaceous wildflowers and grasses that you want to reseed. Pine straw coverage is looser and it allows, uh, it's more likely to have seed to soil contact. So um, it's also readily available and sustainable. Um, oak leaves are acceptable too, especially if you have, a, you know, if you're near or in an oak area. Um, pine bark is also an option, but a little less desirable just because it's a heavier, thicker mulch uh, and coverage is a little bit um, thicker, I guess you say, more, more coverage, um, which doesn't really allow uh, for reseeding in um, wildflowers and grasses. If you're mulching paths, um, we recommend flora mulch, which is made from the invasive melaleuca tree. Cypress mulch is an absolute no. It cannot be used at all. It is a, a horrible environmental disaster and uh, should just not be used at all. And we do not support the use of cypress mulch. So, um, but flora mulch is a good alternative to that. We also uh, are looking for current photos. You need to upload at least one photo with your application, but more are encouraged. Um, all photos should be uploaded as separate JPEG attachments. This is true for all the entire time that you are applying. If you get funding and you're reporting, you don't want these embedded in Word docs or PDFs. We wanna use these photos as educational opportunities. And so we need the actual JPEGs to be able to do that. Um, if you need to send more than the application upload option will allow, you are welcome to email them directly. The more photos, the better. And please label your photos with your project name. Finally, we um, need a design sketch or a plan. It does not need to be a professional design, but it does need to show what and where you're going to be doing. So um, it can be a simple hand drawing like this one you see here. It can be a more detailed hand drawing. Um, you can do a photo and, you know, like this, lay out, superimpose your design over the photo. Or if you have the means to get a professional CAD drawing, that's an op option too. Um, we just need to understand what you are doing, you know, what's the density of the planting, um, how is it going to be laid out, just however you can give that uh, to us, we are, we're okay with. If I do get something that is not, uh, you know, detailed enough, I will come back to you and ask for a little bit more if necessary. So that's all the information we need in the planting project details. Um, we also require an expert review. You need to consult with somebody other than the person leading the project to determine the suitability and sustainability of the area that you've chosen. This can be a landscape designer. It can be a UF IFAS extension rep, a local FNPS or Florida Native Plant Society chapter rep, um, someone from the local nursery that you're going to be working with. It just needs to be, um, you know, someone else who can, who is, who has the appropriate expertise and can not only make sure that what you're planning is sustainable, but also maybe provide feedback too if you have questions or. Um, you know, need assistance determining your plant palette, for example. Um, if you 
can't find anybody in your area, you can certainly contact us and we can try to um, find somebody in, in, in the area for you. The expert, uh, we need to know who they are and what, you know, what organization they represent, and they need to provide a written statement indicated that they've reviewed the site and you know, deemed it appropriate for the proposed plan. A successful proposal also includes evidence of community support. So we are looking um, for information on, you know, who have you partnered with, who is involved, who's going to provide in-kind donations or volunteers or um, other, other means of support. This can be community groups, nonprofits, uh, government agencies, businesses, project sponsors, whatever, whoever you get on board with this project. Um, in a community support for a proposal is really measured by the level and types of commitment. So again, if you you know if they can provide in kind or monetary contributions, that is um, you know definitely beneficial. And those in kind uh, can be volunteer hours or donated services like landscape design. You can have somebody donate the design of the actual um, plan, uh, graphic design for your signage printing services, tools, whatever it might be. Now for the budget. If anybody here on the webinar today has uh, applied in the past, you will see that we have simplified the budget. Um, so you, this is the form you will get. It's an Excel form. You can add rows as needed, but we ask that you please do not add columns or delete any existing rows. Just leave things blank if you don't need to fill everything in. This is just a rough sample. Um, at the very top, you're going to enter the amount that you're requesting. So we have a maximum of $3,000 that we can um, give to any project. You don't have to ask for the full amount. Perhaps your project doesn't require $3,000. That's totally fine. You just need to enter the amount there that you are requesting from the foundation. And then you're going to itemize all of your expenses and put them in the appropriate columns. So the applicant share is all the expenses that your organization is paying for. This might include staff time. Um, it could be printing of brochures. Um, it could be, you know, planting supplies, tools, it doesn't matter what it is, it should go in this column if this is something that you are paying for. The in-kind share is anything that is donated. This includes time, volunteer time, as well as monetary contributions. Um, if it is money, if someone's giving you a donation of $250, you need to say what that $250 is going to be used for. And here in this example, uh, we've allocated it to the printing of a sign. If you have volunteers, you'll need to estimate the number of volunteer hours that will be dedicated to the project and assign a value to that. And I have in the budget the 2020 IRS volunteer hourly rate, which is now $27.20. So you just need to calculate that using that um, rate. This is an estimate. We understand that you know you may not use up all your volunteer hours, or perhaps you may go more. This is just so we can understand that you've planned out the project and that you have um, a plan for maintaining it and, and managing it. Um, certainly, if you if your timing changes or the values change in your budget, that's understandable, at least with regard to that volunteer and staff time. Um, if someone's donating a bench or planting supplies, enter a value for that um, donated item. And again, all donations need to be itemized on here. In the grant share column, this is the funding that you are requesting from the foundation. So you'll want to split that up. Um, again, 80% minimum needs to go for plants or seeds. And you'll see that here, 1,600 of the 2,000 requested is going for plants. The other 400 we've split up with pine straw and floor mulch. Again, this is just a sample. It's a very simplified budget, um, but that's what goes in that grant share column. The total of your grant share column should match the total number of or total amount that you're requesting from the foundation. And 
the total of your applicant and in-kind shares must be equal to or greater than 50% of the match, or excuse me, of the amount you're seeking. That's that match that we require. So I'm requesting $2,000 from the foundation. My applicant and in-kind share totals need to be at least $1,000. So uh, project goals. In this section, you are gonna describe how the planting will achieve our program goals. So you'll describe your plan for outreach and educational materials and programming as it relates to the planting project and program goals. Your application must include outreach and educational components. And I have some examples here to show you. Um, these are just examples. This is not, you, you don't have to do what we show you here. Um, but uh, some of our grantees have done interpretive signs explaining the importance of native plants, um, plant pollinator connections, um, you know, what native plants do in the landscape, things like that. You can provide identification tools such as um, signs. This is a little booklet that was done at Flamingo Gardens where each plant has its own um, laminated page and a booklet that sits out in the garden, or you can be much more simple and um, do hand painted stones or um, just kind of your standard uh, plant ID tags. Um, you can include informational brochures about landscaping with native plants, um, identification brochures or other information that help people again help visitors understand what it is they're seeing and why this is important. We also have a lot of handouts and brochures and our 20 Easy to Grow magazine that we are happy to provide to you if you would like to um, display them or make them available at your uh, demonstration garden. Programming uh, can be a number of things, get creative. Uh, you can do guided walks through the planting um, offer classes or workshops related to native plant landscaping design, propagation, general info on native plants, attracting pollinators. It's really unlimited what you do as long as you are incorporating that native garden into this programming. And of course, we like to see you promoting what you're doing and promoting what we're doing as well. So um, social media posts are great. Um, if you can tag the foundation, that's even better. Um, we like to see information in newsletters, if you do educational videos or presentations, even news releases to um, local newspapers or TV stations. All of that is great outreach to promote what it is you're doing and um, uh, promote our mission, which is you know, to expose people to native plants. Reporting is another um, part of your obligation. You're required to submit four reports during the grant period. The reporting schedule will be determined based on your planting date, and this will be outlined in the contract. So in your application, when you tell us what your project timeline is, and you'll give an estimated planting date, we will then determine um, a reporting schedule and put that in the contract. Reports end up being about quarterly. Um, it varies a little bit, but again, that's all based on when those plants get in the ground. If unavoidable delays occur, I mean, who knows? We have hurricanes, we've had COVID this year, we've had all kinds of things that come up that are unforeseeable and unavoidable. We understand that. You just need to notify me um, immediately when you know your, your schedule has been compromised and we will uh, come up with a new schedule and um, move forward from there. All reports should include um, volunteer hours and visitation numbers specific to the site and programming. And I'll provide a template for each report that gives you the list of questions that I'm looking for answers to. Um, I'll send that out to you a couple weeks in advance along with your due date. Um, just as a reminder, again, it's going to be in that schedule in your contract, so you'll have that information all the time, but I do try to give you reminders um, as we're getting close to the due date. The initial report is going to focus on the installation pro process, um, kind of a, looking for a narrative description of you know what happened, how, how did you do it, how many people helped out, how long did it take, and before, during, and after photos. 
So please try to remember to document the process. Um, all reports, again, will include visitor and volunteer hours. Um, we're looking for photos, especially people enjoying the garden, if that's at all possible. And if you're able to get visitor impressions or you know get quotes from people on the impact of the planting, that's always great too. The final report will require an itemized expense report and receipts. So be sure to hold on to everything related to this project so that you can submit that at the end of the um, grant cycle. And we'll also ask for a maintenance schedule plan for the following year. Now, again, you're only obligated to keep the garden intact for the year that the uh, grant program runs or the grant cycle runs, but we really hope that you will continue this beyond it. And so we would like to know, you know what your plan is once the grant cycle ends. So how do we score projects for consideration? We use a rubric, which consists of 10 components. We rank, and I say we, it's myself and our planting committee. And we review each application and apply it to uh, this rubric. So we look at the quality of your education and outreach plan. Is your programming specific to the project? Are you, um, you know, going to do signage, brochures, other ancillary materials? Are there other educational elements that you're proposing? You know, what, what is your education and outreach plan? Number two is if it is in alignment with our goals and mission. Um, you know, do your educational programming and materials are they, do they align with our mission basically? What is your intended audience? So children's programming is important and we recognize that, but ultimately we want adults to see the planting, learn of the benefits and value of native plants and take action. So children's programming is fine, but it should not be the bulk of the programming that you are proposing with regard to this, um, this grant funded planting. Um, we are looking for programming that is aimed at adults and aimed at the general public to really get them, um, you know, get them the knowledge and understanding of what it is you're trying to convey. Um, the visibility of the planting, is it located in an area of high traffic or high visibility? Again, I mentioned that in the beginning, this is something that's important to us. We, it's great to have it, we, you know, we want these plantings to um, function as a, as a habitat, but it's, it's not meeting our mission if people can't see it and take action from what they've seen. So we do wanna make sure this is in a high, high visibility area. But we also wanna make sure that it has ecological value. Does this project create or enhance habitat? habitat? Does it contribute to habitat connectivity? Does it include species diversity, food sources, nectar, pollen? Is, you have larval hosts included, um, fruit and seeds. Are you providing these resources throughout the year? So, you know, thinking about the plants that you choose, you want things that are going to be blooming throughout the year at different times of the year, and providing food, berries, seeds, nectar all throughout the year. Uh, we're also looking for uh, consideration of, you know, cover and foliage and nesting opportunities. So even though we're trying to demonstrate how people can put these plants in their landscape, it's, it's important that it is actually a functioning ecological landscape too. Um, we look at species appropriateness, make sure that what you're selecting is appropriate for the conditions and the area that you have um, given us, that you've told us you're going to be planting in. We also are looking then on you know, who you're getting your plants from. Is it from a reputable and trusted native plant supplier? This is important. Is the project unique? Does it offer something different that might attract or inspire visitors? Is it sustainable? Does the organization applying have the staff or volunteers to maintain it for the duration of the grant cycle? And is there historical or experiential evidence to support the project's long-term sustainability? And these are all things that we can call from the application and from the questions that we are asking. 
Um, we are looking at the application itself. Have you filled it out correctly and satisfactorily? Is it explicit and intelligible? Um, you know, if we can't understand what you're proposing, um, you know, that's not going to bode well for the review process. And finally, is the project well thought out and well planned? Have you carefully considered what it is you're proposing? Once we score all the applications, the top ranked projects will be considered for funding. We do have limited funding, so we cannot fund all the projects that are proposed to us, much as we you know, would like to be able to do so. Um, occasionally, we will offer a partial award this is something that we do ask in the application. So you have the opportunity to say, yes, a partial award would still be beneficial or no, I need what I'm asking for or I can't do this project. So if you do indicate partial funding is acceptable, we may um, end up offering that. It just depends on you know, what other projects we have um, that we're considering. So now I'm just going to share some photos of a few past Florida, Viva Florida funded projects. And just so you can kind of see some of the different things that have been funded by this program. Um, this is at the Central Florida Zoo and Botanical Garden where they installed a native planting along a creek that runs through the center of the, um, of the garden. Uh, the Orange County UF IFAS extension, they had a wildflower meadow with some nice little paths walking through it. Bach Tower Gardens used our funds for a sandhill restoration right along the main drive and right at uh, the trailhead. And if you've been to Pear Park in uh, Tavares, Leesburg area, they installed a beautiful new bird blind and have uh, a native garden surrounding it. This is uh, one of our current grant program or grant funded gardens. This is Cutting Horse Eco Center in um, Bonita Springs, and they just installed theirs um, over the summer. So they're still in the grant program, but um, it's been a very successful garden. Um, the Marine Discovery Center installed a native plant garden in front of their um, education building. Um, I included this one just to show you. This is at Grow Hub in uh, Gainesville, but they had volunteers um, devise this little border around it using recycled beer bottles. So it just kind of gives it a different, interesting look. At the Public History Center in Stanford, they installed um, five different zones. So each of the gardens is representative of different uh, soil and light conditions. And they had a self-guided tour developed around it too. So people coming um, could actually see things that might work in their varied landscapes too. At E.O. Wilson Biophilia Center in the Panhandle, uh, they had a turtle enclosure that they planted with native wetland species. And this is at Stetson University at the Gillespie Museum where they have done a sandhill demonstration garden uh, right on campus. And if you um, haven't seen it, they did a recent webinar with us where they compared um, or they researched pollinator visits here at this urban garden with um, comparing it to a nearby conservation area. And it really just illustrates the importance of these urban habitats. So that's on our website if you're at all interested. I think that about covers um, the questions, or excuse me, the application process. I'm gonna open it up for questions now, if I can see. I have to figure out Zoom first, so <laughs> bear with me. Let's see, stop that. Bring my video back up. Did not change my name, but I'll do that now. And, um, okay. I see just a couple of questions here. Um, the other 20%, so you can, um, you can use that for whatever you need to use it for. As long as 80% minimum of the amount that you're requesting is allocated to plants, the other 20% can be used for whatever you need to use it for. So educational signage is absolutely um, something that you can be, you can allocate those funds to. Um, let's see, does it matter if there's an entry fee? I'm, I guess you mean to the actual um, garden. 
It doesn't matter. Um, as you saw, we, we funded um, a garden at Bach Tower and at the Central Florida Zoo. These places do have entry fees, um, but they have high visitation. So we are okay with that. Um, it really is just about the exposure and whether or not um, you know, you're gonna get a lot of traffic in there regardless of that entry fee. Um, as far as allowing us access, we do ask that you allow our representatives to have complimentary access just so we can come in and, and see the gardens as needed. Um, let's see. Uh, just to clarify, I'm, I'm going to read these questions out. Just to clarify, we're, we are too late for planting March 2021. And yes, if you are trying to plant in March of next year, we, we, you, your application will not be reviewed in time for um, us to consider it before you get started. So if you apply in January and you want to do a spring planting, you'll need to hold off on that planting until March of 2022. Um, let's see the next question. I belong to a Florida Native Plant Society chapter. We do not own land, but could we apply for the grant and partner with a city park to install the planting? Absolutely. Um, that is what. Um, Cutting Horse Eco Center, which uh, just showed you a photo of that. They are, um, that was applied for and managed by the Coco Loba chapter, chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. Um, any organization or any representative can apply on behalf of a piece of land. You just have to have buy-in from that landowner. So if you have um, you know, a city park that you'd like to consider, you just need to get with the city and you know, get that um, landowner's approval, uh, you know, a letter in writing that says that they permit or they are okay with you installing the, the landscape. So that is absolutely acceptable. Um, let's see, someone's asking about how many applications we receive. It really varies. We've had years where we've had only a handful and we've had years where we've had, um, you know, 20 applications. Um, it really just depends on, um, yeah, well, I don't know what it depends on. It varies from year to year, um, which is why we have sometimes offered partial funding because we you know, maybe we have more program or more applications than we can fund that we would like to. So we have asked, you know, well, can we, we can fund more projects if we can offer a little bit less. So it just does depend. Um, this is something that the committee discusses and determines and discussions of whether, you know, uh, how we rank the projects, um, and what we think might be helpful to get as many projects as we can funded. Uh, let's see, our next question, must in-kind contribution be during the project period? Can recent expenditures be included? Um, I, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Um, it might be something that you could email um, that we can discuss a little bit more in detail. Generally speaking, if you are planning a project now and if you are, if it's, if it's applied to the project that you're seeking funding for, it should be okay. But I would say, um, you know, maybe email me with some specific information so that we can um, talk about that and I can understand more specifically what it is you are asking about. Um, our next question says, can this grant be part of another larger grant project? Um, yeah, I think I, if you're asking if you can, um, if you have a project that you're seeking multiple funding opportunities, that is absolutely okay. Um, the one thing I would say is that if your project is contingent on receiving multiple grants, um, that might be something you want to make clear in your uh, application because as I would understand it, if you did not receive all of those grants that you are aiming for, then perhaps your project wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't be able to do it, in which case we wouldn't want to, you know, give over the funding. Um, but if you're specific about that in your application, 
um, that's something that we can kind of look at and determine what that means with regard to uh, awarding you. We have had projects, um, applications come through with projects that are you know, $20,000 projects. And so we are one of several grant components in that project. And that is, again, acceptable. Um, okay, this uh, comment says, on average, how many do you fund versus applications? Again, that really just depends. Um, you know, if we if we have a lot of really strong applications, we will do our best to fund um, you know as many as we can. But um, it, there there really isn't uh, an answer for that question. It just really depends on what kind of applications we're getting, or what kind of projects are being um, applied for. Sorry. I think um, that is. All of the questions I see here. Um, again, I am always available now until whenever. Um, so please, if you have questions that I didn't answer today or, or that you're thinking about applying and um, you know something comes up, you're absolutely welcome to email me at any time. If you're in the application process and something doesn't make sense to you, um, again, you are um, you know, welcome to reach out and ask questions. I'm, I'm always here to help and want to help you get that application right and really make sure that, um, you know, you have everything you need. So please reach out for me, reach out to me. I am here. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so I will um, get it posted in the next uh, day or so. So you are welcome to, you know, rewatch it if you still have questions or don't remember everything I said. Um, and um, share it with anyone else that you know that might be interested uh, as well. So um, thank you all for attending and um, I look forward to seeing your applications next, next uh, January or March, whenever you get to it. Thanks.